Now last week I did a piece on the beginnings of IndyCar Split, a civil war in American open wheel racing that many have said has set the series back more than the 12 years that this split actually lasted. Now as a recap, what had happened was Tony George, who owned the Indianapolis Motor Speedway at this time, had set up what was called the Indy Racing League for 1996, a way of going back to the roots of American open wheel racing by allowing the dirt oval stars of that time a route up to the Indy 500 because he felt that it had lost its way. The problem was that none of the drivers that started the 1996 Indy 500 were considered household names. I mean, there was Buddy Lazier who won that race, and Holland's Ari Leyendijk who was the only previous Indy 500 winner on the grid in 1996. There was also Tony Stewart, but even then he had to go to NASCAR to really achieve superstardom. This was because what had happened was Kart had been shut out by the organisers of the Indy 500 to try and twist their arms into joining this new racing series because the, th the thinking was that they would never abandon the Indy 500 because it's the most prestigious event. But the best way to put this into terms of British and European audiences can understand is imagine the English Football Association changing the rules of the FA Cup so that the Premier League teams won't be allowed to compete, or at least very few. Premier League teams would be allowed to compete because like Kart the Premier League was a breakaway competition it broke away from USAC in the 70s and then you got the IRL that had broken away from uh, Kart but while Kart was done in the best interest of the sport and the IRL to that extent the Premier League was all about one thing television money but I digress so what we're left with now is these two series going at it in racing's equivalent of the Monday Night Wars, the television ratings battle between two pro wrestling companies, WCW owned by Ted Turner and the WWF owned by Vince McMahon, the World Wrestling Federation, but that is now WWE. So you've got fans, sponsors and teams not knowing what to do with themselves because they wanted to either race at or watch the Indy 500 with all these other star names, but... Instead, they were all racing at Michigan and the fans didn't know what to do there because it was like, do I watch Indy where there's nobody there or do I watch the US 500 that at least has drivers and teams that I know? And you don't need to be a professional geographist to know that Michigan ain't Indy. So picking up where we left off, we need to consider what this was doing for the lower division drivers and teams as well as the ones that were already racing in kart. So episode one was about the politics and how it all started. This is all about what happened to... The money. Indy Lights is to IndyCar what GP2 is to Formula 1. Well, it's now Formula 2 or F3000 if you're as old as I am. And the next logical step up for these teams was to move into kart because then they could race against all of their favourite drivers and the big names and attract some sponsors as well as you know participate at the Indy 500 as we've already established the most prestigious event on the calendar and one of the most prestigious events in motor racing. But the Indy 500 was no longer part of the kart calendar, it was on the IndyCar calendar, while the IRL calendar, they couldn't actually call it IndyCar just yet. So you've got a bunch of drivers and teams that wanted to be at Indy racing against the likes of Alan Jr. and Team Penske and Chip Ganassi and so on. And there were also names now in cast that were names that were already established in other motorsports or were promising young rookies. Names like Alex Zanardi, Dario Franchitti, Greg Moore, and some Brazilian bloke called Robert Brown. Again, to use the football analogy, you're playing for Lincoln City and you've drawn Manchester United in the third round of the FA Cup. So you're going to be playing against names like David De Gea, Paul Pogba, Fred, Cristiano Ronaldo. You're going to get demolished, but you'll be on the same pitch as one of the greatest players that ever lived, Scott McTominay. Now, imagine that the Premier League teams weren't allowed to take part in the FA Cup, and instead of playing Manchester United in the third round, you're playing Warsaw. Now, if you're into your IndyCar, you'll have most likely heard of a guy called Marshall Pruitt, and he was a mechanic at Genoa Racing in Indy Lights in 1995, when he first met the CEO of IndyCar, Jack Long. Now, Jack must have taken some pills that morning that sent his brain a bit loopy, because at a meeting at Laguna Seca at the end of 1995 Indy Lights season, Long had approached Genoa's boss, Thomas Knapp, with what he must have thought was a brilliant idea. 
At the hotel where the team was having dinner in Monterey, just a little bit up the road from the Laguna Seca track, Knapp was approached by Long, and Long said, I can get you an engine deal with Cowsworth for a million dollars. Long's job that day was to recruit as many of the Indy Lights teams as he possibly could for the first IRL season in 1996. Now, in Pruitt's own words, Genoa had been part of the cart ladder for a very long time, so cart was the next logical step up. But the IRL needed teams for 1996, and you also have to bear in mind that the budget for teams in Indy Lights in 1995 was about 800 grand to 1.1 million dollars. So Knapp, who didn't really take kindly to BS, just went, hey, we spend that a year for Indy Lights. Why would he spend that much money on an engine in a series nobody wants? But Knapp's offer wasn't a stupid one in the grand scheme of things. In cart, they leased engines, and the total cost would have put the engine lease spend at around 2 million for the whole year. In the IRL, they'd be buying the engines and get to keep them, and they'd be spending half of that money. But for the teams in Indy Lights, they'd rather spend the 2 million and get to race against Penske. Now, the IRL, which was legally allowed to be called IndyCar by 1997, was actually offering cheaper racing and bigger prize purses, but the teams would have still rather spent $8 million a year to race against Penske. The IRL firmly believed that without the Indy 500, Kart would have no choice but to swap over, but still, Penske, Ganassi, Forsyth and so on still resisted. But there was some scepticism. While the IRL was indeed offering cheaper racing with bigger prize purses, some felt that this was all a way of getting people in. But while at the same time, it was all about control and keeping the massive paychecks right at the top in what could have been a very, very lucrative business. The cheap racing, like I said, was just getting people through the door and getting as many as humanly possible on the grid and then make those at the top look good. Kart was still winning in terms of the ratings through 1997 thanks to the star power of the drivers involved, and the 25-8 rule was dropped for the Indy 500 in 1998 to allow anybody with a car to try out for the race. The Indy 500 was considered an open event where people qualified on merit, as opposed to being a more exclusive event where three quarters of the grid was automatically locked in and guaranteed to start. Because if you remember, 1995, Penske, the biggest team in IndyCar, failed to qualify, but still, no kart teams went for the Indy 500 that year. Also in 1998, while still experiencing growing pains for his new All-American All-Oval series that was losing viewers due to the knack of named drivers, was also losing sponsors and people no showing to events because my engine noise, Tony George flew to London where he met with none other than Bernie Eccleston. At that time, Formula 1 had not been to America since 1991 when it ran a street race in Phoenix, Arizona. And in the discussions that George had with Bernie, he said basically that the year 2000 is just around the corner. Formula 1 can't ignore the US anymore and if you're going to have a race in America, it has to be at Indianapolis. A few days before this meeting, the IMS officials had sent Formula 1 a proposed road course layout and George said, I've got the budget to do this, we'll get 150,000 people through the gate and I can get started on this tomorrow. He also managed to get NASCAR on board and seeing as Kart and Indy were hemorrhaging sponsors, NASCAR was now starting to become big, if not bigger, than both open wheel series. So it made sense. George was able to maximize the assets that the track had to make money rather than doing it through his series. So if IndyCar is hemorrhaging viewers, sponsors and money, then Kart's going to win like everybody said it would, right? Well, not necessarily. While Kart's revenue increased to $68 million in 1999, oval attendances were dropping and TV revenue was down as well. It actually pulled in less TV revenue than NASCAR was pulling in. Also in 1999, the championship battle between Juan Pablo Montoya and Dario Franchitti was overshadowed by the deaths of Gonzalo Rodriguez and Greg Moore. And Moore's death in itself really put an emphasis on driver safety going forward because the Kart cars were monstrously fast because remember, 240 miles an hour. They were monstrously fast, but they were death traps. And to make more money, Kart decided that street circuits were the future. Then into the year 2000, Chip Ganassi, under pressure from his main sponsors, returned to the Indy 500, which Montoya decimated. The Kart cars were much faster than the IRL counterparts, and the 25-8 rule was no more, so Montoya destroyed the field to win. But while Montoya won the 1999 Indy 500, the real winner 
was Tony George, because he'd lured back one of Kart's big teams with their big money sponsors and their big name drivers. The following year, Penske was back and Helio Castroneves took the first of his four Indy 500 wins. But it's in 2001 where the nails in Kart's coffin would start to be hammered in, and for that year alone, we would have to do a dedicated video. So then, a look at the big money side of the American open wheel civil war. If you are a British or European viewer that's learned something today, then be sure to like the video. And if you want to know when the next part of this mini-series comes out, make sure that you're subscribed and that bell is on so you don't miss out. Massive thanks as ever go out to the good folk of Patreon for their continued support and if you want to help support the channel through helping to fund images and you know, the licensing that comes with that, upgrades, software, that kind of thing, a link to Patreon is in the description box along with links to Discord and also to my socials. I'm also still trying to work this camera stuff out. I know that it's reflecting off my glasses. I do need new glasses so I'll get the, the anti-glare stuff put on those. But any tips to, to make this look good, I greatly appreciate it. I've been following tutorials but... I think I kind of need to be shown by an actual human. So, yeah, let me know how it's looking down in the comments and uh, leave leave some extra tidbits of information as well because, you know, 2001 means Texas. So if you've got any information, leave that in and I'll uh, and I'll pop it into the next video. So until next time, I've been Aidan Moore. Have a great day wherever you live in the world and I'll see you all again soon for another video. So until then, goodbye.